Tokyo professor of public diplomacy at Kyoto University, Nancy Snow, joins us now live. Thanks so much for speaking to us. Give us a sense, if you can, you're there. I mean, how important an event is this for Japan? Would it compare, for example, to you know, a similar event with the UK's royal family? Well, I think it's an extraordinary year. We're about six months into Reiwa. And for those of us who were outside the Imperial Palace on May 1st, uh, we saw Act One. This is really Act Two. It's a series of uh, acts going forward the first year with the new emperor. There's a lot of excitement. Uh, Akihito, with his abdication, uh, was setting a precedent. And uh, of course, the diet, the, the government had to weigh in on that and give him this one off abdication. But I think that we're really curious about how the new emperor and empress are going to uh, conduct themselves internationally. They have this very strong diplomatic background. Uh, it's very well known, for instance, that the empress uh, served as a diplomat professionally for about five years before she uh, agreed to marry the future emperor. And, and that was in 1993. Right. Talk a little bit more about Empress Masako. I'm curious. I mean, what kind of role she's going to play going forward, and how would she compare uh, to her predecessors? Well, you know, I've seen some documentary footage uh, actually showing both of them, but I really zeroed in on her. And they were visiting uh, survivors in shelters. This was following the Kobe earthquake in 95, so shortly into their marriage. And then most recently, after the very large triple disaster that we call 311 here in March of 2011. And I've never seen so much display of emotion. She was really on eye level uh, with people, and there was a, an elderly woman who said this was going to be the moment in her life that she would never forget. I really think these two are going to be wonderful representatives of Japan and the world. Uh, they don't have to be political. They can really uh, promote the messages that were so strong today about peace and happiness and harmony. Uh, those are messages that we should hear about every day. And um, there was just so much going on today, even with the regalia and with the big reveal of the emperor on the throne. Uh, those thrones are a hundred years old and they were disassembled in Kyoto and reassembled in Tokyo, so they were delivered over the last year. There's a lot of background that goes into all of this, and it comes across as if they are <laughs> real pros, but I happen to know that those uh, regal um, outfits that they're wearing, including her kimono from the 10th century, the design, they're very heavy and uh, they're very difficult to walk in. So it was rather extraordinary to see. Right. It's interesting, Nancy. I mean, you said that they don't necessarily have to be political, but as a couple, how kind of influential could they be? Do you think they could prove to be reformers of sorts, particularly by advancing the role of women in Japan? Well, indeed, they could be. And again, not in a political sense. So you wouldn't have the empress uh, Masako giving a speech on uh, women's empowerment per se, but just in her behavior and how she comports herself, that alone symbolically can represent so much. Uh, they've been together a long time and, and really even the way that he handled the illness that she had some 15 years ago where she was isolated and he came out and spoke to the press and tried to explain that with her strong academic background and her diplomatic experience, it was it was difficult to make the adjustment to the the palace life. And I thought it showed a lot of sensitivity. So there are ways that they can address issues that involve society that don't have to get into the politics. Politics is the day to day struggle. But theirs can be very inspiring and inclusive messages that everybody can can enjoy. And also her daughter is about to, their daughter is about to turn 18, and she'll be very interesting to watch, too. She had a 
an experience for a couple of weeks at Eton College last year in the UK. So she's taking more of that diplomatic uh, road as well. Uh, that's interesting there. I mean, what, give us an idea if, uh, as a family, there are some kind of, how do I phrase this, like preferred initiatives, if I can put it that way. We see Prince Charles uh, in the UK take on climate change, for example. Does the royal family in Japan have causes that they take particular interest in and maybe could forward the agenda on those? A hundred percent. And uh, with, the, with the emperor, he has a great deal of interest in the relationship between water and, and people. And of course, this is too about sustainability and climate change. He's the only royal who's, who's given a speech at the UN back in 2013. And uh, he has this academic background. He's even published a book about the River Thames and I think it's called The River Thames and I. And uh, so I could see him really going forward and getting involved more in this issue, which again has a, a concern uh, around the world. So it's really putting Japan on the global stage. And it's something he's been involved with for years. So in terms of international relations and also the environment and the waterways, Japan has to deal with so much in terms of these recent typhoons, which is why they postponed the motorcade today. Uh, so I really anticipate that he will speak on this going forward. Great. Nancy Snow, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us from Tokyo.